So let me start over um, and introduce Professor Philip Metzger, who comes to us from the University of Central Florida, where, is he, where he's a research professor at the Florida Space Institute. Before that, he was at NASA Kennedy Space Center for a good 20 years. He's an expert in granular mechanics, granular materials, and he's going to talk to us about resources for 3D additive construction on the moon, asteroids, and Mars. Please welcome Philip Metzger. Thank you for having me here today. It's my pleasure. Um, so Rob did a great job setting the stage and uh, talking about the, the environment where we're going to be doing 3D additive construction in space. I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on the resources that are there to do 3D additive construction. It's an impossible topic because there's so much material that we could cover. The, the diversity of the resources, the information we know about them would take far more than the 45 minutes we've got. On the other hand, there's so much we don't know about them. All, there's a lot of information we need to know, but we don't, haven't gone and done the ground truthing yet. So we've got both too much information and not enough information. Um, so I'm gonna have to down select and just talk about some of it, but we're talking about innovating and so we don't know what materials we're gonna use yet. And so I don't know what selections to make. So we're just gonna give you a little taste about resources in space. So we're going to start with the moon, um, our nearest neighbor, Earth's eighth, eighth continent. Um, moon's resources, as Rob mentioned, has, include sunlight, regolith. They're volatiles, we know, on the moon. Uh, they're exotics, such as uh, remnants of asteroid impacts, perhaps, recycled spacecraft. They're also derived resources. We can take what's on the moon and, and process them to make other things. And then vacuum. Um, as far as the regolith, the global el average elemental composition, it's mostly, or it's uh, about 43% oxygen. Um, the entire moon is an ore body of oxygen. People say there are no ore bodies on the moon, but the whole moon is an ore body. And oxygen, uh, launching oxygen is the largest cost in spaceflight. Um, the moon also has ample silicon, iron, calcium, aluminum, magnesium, and other elements. Now that's a global average. Um, let me give a little bit of terminology. The regolith mean, refers to the broken up rocky material that blankets a planet, including the boulders, gravel, sand, dust, and any organic material. Lunar soil is the regolith excluding pieces that are larger than about a centimeter. Now here on the Earth, people, uh, people object to saying lunar soil sometimes. On the Earth, when we say soil, we're referring to material that has organic content, but it's by convention that when we say lunar soil, we're not implying any organic content. It's a valid term to say soil on the moon. Lunar dust would be the fraction of the regolith that's smaller than about 20 microns. And lunar geology does not generally separate these from another. So the dust is thoroughly mixed into the soil. The soil is mixed into the regolith with larger particles. Um, Regolith is formed by impacts. It's the dominant geological process on the moon. Larger impacts, asteroids and comets, fracture the bedrock and throw out ejecta blankets. And it mixes the regolith both laterally and in the vertical column. Because of this lateral mixing, anywhere you go on the moon and grab a handful of soil, you will have soil particles from every part of the moon. Um, it doesn't thoroughly mix the entire moon. If you look, you'll see dark spots and bright areas. Um, but there, there are some particles in every part of the moon from every part of the moon because of the lateral mixing. Um, micrometeorite gardening, smaller impacts wear down rocks into soil. It makes the soil finer. It creates glass, including agglutinates, which are um, splatters of molten material that uh, solidify into glass and glue other lithic particles together. Um, the impacts of micrometeorites also vaporized material, which then deposits on all the surrounding grains and creates a glass patina, which has important properties I'll mention later. Um, the lunar soil, because of this, is completely unlike terrestrial soil. And we have tried to create lunar soil simulants, but we cannot create a perfect simulant. It's too expensive. We spent $10,000 per ton or $100,000 per ton making different simulants. And even so, they do not capture all the properties we need of the moon. So therefore, we have to develop simulants that meet our specific needs. And we have to have families of simulants for specific tasks. Um, some pictures of this interesting regolith. You can see the boot print, uh, Aldrin's uh, boot print. He took that... He did that footstep as a um, geotechnical experiment. It was the first granular materials experiment in space. 
he made a nice clean footprint and took a picture and it shows the cohesion of the soil because there are vertical faces inside that boot print, even though it's bone dry. Um, and people still try to understand the source of all the sources of cohesion in the lunar soil. On the upper right, we have an agglutinate particle, which is a glass substrate with other particles embedded. Um, lower left is a, a picture of an individual dust grain. You can see that it's sharp and angular. It hasn't been weathered uh, like particles on Earth, so it's still got sharp edges. And on the right, we see a little sample of soil particles, including glass spherules. That was molten material that solidified before it landed, and so it, the surface tension pulled it into a sphere. Um, there are rock fragments. There are um, pure uh, mineral fragments, as well as the agglutinates. Um, the moon has boulders and cobbles, of course. Uh, those could be a resource if you're doing construction in space. Rock fields are usually around younger craters. That's because the rocks are slowly dissolved into the regolith by micrometeoroid impacts. Now, here's a rock that was partially buried in the soil. The upper surface is rounded where it was exposed. The lower surface that was covered by, by other regolith deposits uh, was protected, and so the edges um, stayed sharp over millions of years. Um, so there may be more rocks under the surface than we can see on the top because of this. And if you want rocks for construction, then we could perhaps use soil rakes to extract them from the regolith. Um, the rest of the soil, smaller than the rocks and the boulders, uh, the part we call the soil, um, has a characteristic particle size distribution, which is a result of space weathering. And um, as a rule, of, this is a cumulative fraction of the soil by mass that is smaller than. So um, if you look at 10, uh, 10 millimeters or one centimeter, it's approximately 100% of the soil is finer than one centimeter. So a couple of rules of thumb that we use is roughly 50% of the mass is smaller than 50 microns, 10% less than 10 microns. So 50 less than 50, 10 less than 10, that's just a rule of thumb. But there is some variation um, depending on the maturity of the soil. Let's see, why is this not going? Don't know how to operate it. Yeah, it's not working. So it's working on the screen here, but not up there. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to make sure I'm on the right one, though. Shouldn't be that big of a time lag. It's not a big, uh, it's not a uh, lot of graphics on this next chart. Yeah. Just reading off the. Copy it off the desktop. All right. I don't know how to get out of this. Um, you want to do that? Go ahead. Problem is, it won't come out of the. Oh, there we go. Now it's moving. Yeah, let's copy it over. Where's the, uh, I don't see the cursor. It's over there. There we go. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, you got your dual screen activated. All right. Okay, very good. Apologies, everybody, for that. Okay, so thank you. It's good enough. Okay, so the particle size distribution is a function of the maturity of the soil. Whenever fresh regolith is created through a large impact that fractures and um, breaks up bedrock and throws it out, creating a new blanket around the, the impact site, um, that material is coarse, relatively coarse regolith, and we call it immature. Um, as, uh, as it sits weathering on the surface, it eventually uh, becomes finer and finer until it becomes what we call mature soil. Now, once it's mature, there's a, a balance of fracturing large particles and gluing together small particles, and it reaches a steady particle size distribution. Um, I'm going to skip for the sake of time a couple of these. Uh, let me just mention flowing lunar soil is important to consider. The particles are sharp and angular, high friction, um, because of the, the large dust content, there's a lot of cohesion, therefore it doesn't flow well, and then making it worse on the moon, you've got low gravity. We've done experiments, Rob took some uh, series of experiments in reduced gravity aircraft, and um, we, were, we saw that even in an orifice that large, the simulated lunar soil would just hang in lunar gravity, it wouldn't go through the hole. Um, bridging even across a large opening is a problem. And so um, the simulants are not usually that good at, at replicating this fact. Uh, JSC-1A flows far too easily compared to lunar soil. The NULH2 series of simulants is much better, but it's very expensive. Um, so, uh, but on the moon, you're going to need technologies for preventing jamming, including perhaps pneumatic transfer, which we're shown testing here on the right. Um, and uh, or magnetic methods or vibration, but we've seen that when you use vibration to, to help flow the soil, it actually compacts the soil and makes it flow less in some cases. This is important if you've got a feed system on your additive manufacturing unit. Um, you need to consider how the regolith is gonna flow. Um, the composition of the soil, it's a mixture of minerals, as I've already mentioned, um, with lateral mixing through impacts. Um, nevertheless, there are local and regional variations in the regolith. Uh, but uh, you can see this picture, there's uh, plagioclase and proxenes and basalts and glass all mixed together. Now, if you want a specific mineral, because you want to do a specific chemical process to get aluminum, perhaps, you might ask, well, can we beneficiate this? Can we sort the, the sand grains to get all one mineral? People have worked on this. Um, one method we've used is magnetic. Now, um, the magnetic behavior of lunar soil is dominated by nanophase iron. Now this is a, uh, a uh, scanning electron microscope uh, view of a sand grain where this is the upper surface of the grain and there is this rim of um, a few tens of nanometers thickness of vapor deposited glass and it contains these little spots of iron which form in the vapor deposition process. We call these nanophase iron because although iron is ferromagnetic, they're too small to behave ferromagnetically, and so they behave super paramagnetically, um, which means when you apply a magnetic field, they align with it. When you take away the magnetic field, their magnetic field vanishes. There's no remnant mag magnetization. Um, now, the small particles have more surface area per mass than the large particles, and therefore the, f the fine dust dominates the magnetic response in the soil. And so if you try to do beneficiation, you end up sorting by size instead of by, by mineral. Um, Larry Taylor did extensive work trying to beneficiate soil using magnetic fields, and his work showed a null result. He was not able to beneficiate. Um, there, there are still some ideas out there on how we might be able to do it, so it's not a, a completely closed question. Um, others have worked on using electrostatics to beneficiate. Dust becomes electrically charged by UV light, which is photocharging, or by friction, which is tribocharging. Um, we've uh, had great progress in controlling dust to clean surfaces using 
uh, electric fields. Here's an example of an experiment or a technology that's been developed where you've got a dusty surface, there are electrodes in the surface, and when you apply a stepping voltage, it moves the dust right off the surface almost immediately. Um, Jackie Quinn and company have tried to use electrostatics to beneficiate. They showed successful concentration of ilmenite and other minerals. However, that's been, that result has been questioned by the community. People say that the materials they were using weren't appropriate, they, they weren't as good as actual lunar soil or various other problems. And so I'm gonna have to say that's still an open question as well. Is that a timer? Okay. <laughs> Um, I mentioned there's mare, which is more basaltic. There are the highlands, which are more feldspathic minerals. Um, there's also regional variations. Um, in the mare, there are high titanium mare and low titanium mare. And there are also local variations. So sometimes by just driving around, you can get a better mixture of minerals than what you have um, lying right at your feet. And so that may be the easiest way to beneficiate, just drive around. Um, there's also creep terrain on the moon, which is potassium rare earth elements and phosphorus. It also corresponds to areas of high uranium, thorium, and potassium. So if you're looking for these minerals, there are places on the moon where it's more concentrated in the regolith. Um, one thing we need for 3D printing are, would be binders. Unfortunately, there are no clay minerals on the moon because we haven't had the type of weathering that we have on the earth. Um, clay minerals are formed by, by um, chemical weathering of feldspar material, minerals. Um, there could be artificial, you could do artificial chemical weathering and try to create clays out of the lunar uh, feldspars, but it's never been tested, it's just a concept, TRL2 at this point. Uh, there is sulfur on the moon, which could be used as a binder. It's very low concentration, um, 0.16 to 0.27% in the mare soils. Um, it may be extracted and you would have a side benefit of getting other solar wind implanted volatiles just by heating large quantities of the regolith. Um, however, sulfur may not be the best uh, binder because in the lunar daytime, the temperature approaches the melting point of sulfur. Um, people have also developed ways of making basalt fibers by heating and then pulling the mare, the basalt minerals. Um, so you could create something like a fiberglass on the moon, which would have some tensile strength. Um, but anyways, this is a key challenge in additive construction, which hopefully this group will be thinking about. How do we have binders on the moon? Um, there are volatiles on the moon as well. Uh, hydrogen has been implanted by solar wind over long periods of time. It's about 65 parts per million equatorially, higher than that near the poles where it's cooler. Uh, there's still some question whether it's just a monolayer deposit on the surface or whether it's been worked into the bulk. My understanding is uh, there was a recent paper that argues that it's actually a bulk, um, a bulk resource in the soil um, throughout the moon. Um, there are also ice deposits in the permanently shadowed regions of the moon and per perhaps also frost that's on the surface of the um, permanently shadowed regions. This is a picture of epithermal neutron count rates, uh, looking at the poles of the moon, and you can see um, it's the presence, uh, this is showing us the presence of hydrogen in the regolith, and you see high concentrations near the poles and especially in the permanently shadowed regions. The Elcross spacecraft impacted on the moon, and when it did, it blew up four to six metric tons of, ma of material, including about 20% of that mass as volatiles. Now the volatiles were not just water, they also included methane, ammonia, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, metals including sodium, silver, and mercury. Um, so it seems like these, the ice at the poles of the moon is the result of comets uh, impacting and being caught in the cold trap of the poles over long periods of time. It's comet residue. Um, the physical state of that ice is unknown. Is it hard lenses of ice? Is it flu uh, fluffy snow? Is the regolith itself fluffy or compacted? There's reasons to believe it may be very fluffy, um, including the L-cross results themselves. Uh, other resources on the moon. There was a paper in Nature recently which suggested that 25% of asteroid impactors did not vaporize on impact, and the fragments of those asteroids can be found in the central uplift peaks of the impact craters. Um, so if you could find a large crater that was formed by an M-class asteroid, there could be pure metal on the moon, perhaps. 
Um, recycling old spacecraft parts is another really important thing to consider for resource on the moon. Derivative lunar resources. We can make plastics using the carbon in the lunar ice, along with hydrogen from the lunar ice, uh, to make methane and then use the Fischer-Tropsch process to polymerize the methane into more complex hydrocarbons. Um, we can refine metals from the soil and make ceramics. And um, However, processing requires significant infrastructure and energy, so you need to consider the scope of what you're trying to do. One of the key technologies for extracting metals from the regolith would be molten regolith electrolysis. This has undergone the most tech development so far. And that's where you take regolith, you melt it, and you run electrical current between some cathodes and anodes. The electrical current electrolyzes the minerals. It allows the oxygen to escape from the regolith. And then you get a um, two-layer melt where you've got slag floating on top of a mongrel alloy. Rob talked about mongrel alloys. Well, this is why we talk about mongrel alloys. Um, iron is a really good, um, a really good solvent. And so, although aluminum is lighter than iron, it doesn't separate in the melt. It'll be dissolved in the iron along with silicon. And so, um, and titanium or whatever else we get. So the question is, can we use whatever we get? Is it adequate in low lunar gravity as a building material? Um, we've done a lot of study. Uh, this work was done by, um, oh, his name is slipping my mind. Um, uh, the, the, the intern. Brandon, tell me, help me out. Sam Schreiner, that's right. Sam Schreiner at MIT, this was his doctoral dissertation. Um, so uh, by using different operating temperatures and using different input uh, minerals, you can, uh, you see the total mass in the melt reduces as the oxygen comes out, the amount of slag reduces, and you get more of the desired products. Um, we've done, uh, Sam and company have done a lot of work doing the physical and chemical modeling, full physics modeling, and they've looked at the amount of oxygen production compared to the mass of the hardware that you need and the power that you need. It takes about five times more energy to extract a mongrel alloy than it would be to make aluminum on the earth using bauxite. So it is energy intensive. Um, fluorine is processing is another alternative. There was a, a good paper written by Jeff Landis at the Glenn Research Center more recently than the, the diagram here. Um, but using uh, fluorine and potassium salts, you reduce the melting point of the regolith and the, the salt chemistry helps you to separate the, the different m minerals. Um, caustic dissolution and electrolysis is another method using sodium hydroxide uh, to uh, help melt the regolith and separate out the different elements. And this one, looks like we may actually separate the iron and the aluminum from each other, but this is just a concept. It's never been actually developed beyond TRL2 at this point. Um, there are other methods we've worked on, hydrogen reduction uh, of ilmenite. This one, we've actually built prototypes and tested them on Mauna Kea. Um, you, you don't have to put just ilmenite in it. You can put just complete mixture of all minerals in the regolith. Um, when you do that, it's not as energy efficient. Um, unfortunately, this looks like it's a good technology for getting oxygen, but it doesn't get you all the way to a usable metal, not even a mongrel alloy. Uh, methane reduction of ilmenite is another possibility, or, or it's also called carbothermal. This is another one that we've built. We've taken it to Mauna Kea and tested it. Again, it looks like it's great for oxygen production, but it doesn't quite reduce the, the regolith enough to get a, a good mongrel alloy. Um, here's another picture of the carbothermal test on Mauna Kea that we did back in, I think it was 2010. Um, we've also done testing or reduced gravity flights of many of these technologies. So there's been some progress. Um, in 1980, there was a study, what can you do if, if you take this to the limit? Uh, put a lot of different processing technologies together on the moon. And they, with a, a large group of stu uh, study participants, they came up with a, a list of factory components and they scoped it out somewhat and they found that for 100 tons of hardware on the moon they could create 80% of itself. It could almost replicate itself. Um, and so uh, you could end up having a self-replicating lunar factory where factories build factories and you can grow a very large industry on the moon. Uh, that's in the long term. Let's move on now to asteroids. Uh, I don't have as much to talk about asteroids because NASA has done most of ISRU work so far for the lunar case. Uh, some basics about asteroids, Rob already mentioned. 
the, they seem to be covered with regolith. Um, most, perhaps, are covered with regolith. Regolith is apparently formed by thermal fatigue. As the asteroids are rotating, the rocks on the surface are heating and cooling repeti repeatedly. And so fractures, little cracks, will get longer and longer, and eventually pieces fall off the rocks, and it's continuously producing regolith. Um, many of the asteroids are rubble piles, where they're completely broken up through impacts. And um, another important basic, is, basic fact is that asteroids are divided into many spectral classes. And we have insight into the composition of these different spectral class asteroids by looking at meteorites. Well, we have some ground truth data on the asteroids, and we look at the, the spectra of the meteorites and compare it to the spectra of the asteroids. It's a little bit com complicated because of space weathering. The surfaces on the asteroids are, are, have been treated differently than the surfaces of the meteorites that have just come through the atmosphere. Um, but we get insight into the composition of the asteroids this way. Um, asteroids are also divided into many trajectory classes, and I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I mentioned regolith. We know there are boulders, cobbles, and gravels, gravel on asteroid surfaces. We're not sure how much fine material. We don't really have photographs that are uh, fine enough pixelation to, to individually see sand particles on the asteroids yet. But Hayabusa did bring back some particles from Itakawa, and, and there were sand-sized particles that were brought back. Um, but we can't really tell you about particle size distribution on asteroids yet. Um, there's some thinking that they may be denuded in finer particles because of electrostatic winnowing. In the low gravity, any charge that forms on the particles could loft them off the surface and the solar wind sweep them away. So it could be that the surface of asteroids are, are very coarse. Um, nevertheless, we do see things that we've called dust ponds, where it's a, it's a, um, a surface at one, uh, sort of what I'm going to call it, an altitude in that gravity field. Um, and so apparently with a very uh, good flow ability, the material has settled in and leveled off at that, um, that height in the gravity field of the asteroid. Um, Spectral classes, it's a very huge subject, and so I'm only going to show a few of the different spectral types. Um, S-type, which means stony, um, minerals like olivine, peroxine, and also metals. Uh, C is carbonaceous, that includes clay minerals and um, carbon compounds. The clay minerals have a lot of hydrogen, hydroxyl and or water, uh, perhaps 20 or 30 percent water in the clay minerals. M class, M type would be the metals, um, and then there are others. A very complicated field. Um, a few pictures, um, iron meteorites, you can see the cross section on the right, beautiful, beautiful metal structure inside the asteroid um, and the meteorite. Um, these were believed to be from the core of a differentiated body that then broke up under impact. So the reason it's pure metal is that there was differentiation process that did that for us. So unlike if you go to the moon, you've got to pull the metals out of the minerals. Um, some of the asteroids, gravity and, and the differentiation process has already done that for us. Stony irons, believed to come from the mantle of this differentiated body, the mantle close to the core. So the minerals are olivine, which are a mantle mineral, and then the, me the metal is a nickel iron alloy. Then there are stony meteorites and stony asteroids. Um, there are both chondritic and achondritic. Chondrites are little spheres that are found inside the meteorite, and we still don't really know what causes chondrites to form. Um, stony achondritic meteorite. Um, and then the carbonaceous ones, uh, which include clays and um, carbon compounds perhaps like about 2 or 3% carbon compounds. And they're like kerogen or um, bituminous clay or bitumen. Um, so it's a, a tarry mixture of very long carbon chains and carbon rings. And it's carcinogenic. Um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons will come out when you heat it. So you have to be careful working with it. Um, NASA has, developed, uh, has funded the development of asteroid simulants both regolith and competent rocks. So I'm working on that at the University of Central Florida. We're trying to develop several spectral classes of simulants. 
And I want to mention there's a workshop at the University of Central Florida, October 6 through 7. We would like people who are going to work with asteroid simulants to come to the workshop and give us your requirements. And we're going to spend a day and a half talking about what the community needs, what kind of simulants we need. Um, so what are the best spectral class asteroids for mining? Well, it depends on your business case. Uh, and uh, the asteroid mining companies aren't going around telling their competitors their business case. Uh, so there's not much out there on, on this topic. But there have been a few spectral classes mentioned. Carbonaceous is everybody's favorite, apparently, because it contains water, um, and it also contains some metal. Um, so you get two most important resources right there together. Uh, they also have clay minerals, which could be used as a binder for 3D printing, um, like serpentines or uh, lizardite clays. Um, and I mentioned the organic compounds, which could be used to make plastics. Uh, there are also S-class asteroids. Um, the ones that are compositionally similar to LL chondrites seem interesting. Um, LL means low iron and low metal. Um, Low iron, meaning including the iron oxides, and then low metal, meaning the non-oxides. Um, although it's low metal, nevertheless, the LL chondrites appear to be the highest in platinum group metals. Um, so people have been interested in them for mining. And then the M class, where you can get metal directly. Uh, unfortunately, the metal asteroids, the metal is extremely hard, and it's going to require very high energy to cut and process. Phobos and Deimos, the two moons of Mars appear to be captured asteroids. We still don't know if they really are captured asteroids or did they accrete in orbit around Mars because of impact ejecta. We don't know. But um, they could very well be captured D or C type asteroids, carbonaceous, and therefore possibly with water. Although th that's been disputed, the surface chemistry of Phobos seems to be pretty dry. Um, that could be just because it's been in Mars orbit for millions and millions of years, billions of years perhaps, and therefore it's been desiccated more than most near-Earth asteroids. And if that's the case, if it's only desiccated, then that would be a surface effect, and so the, the deeper material on Phobos could be very wet. Um, but we need ground truth to be sure about this. Uh, just a nice little picture. The Swamp Works put this picture together, uh, had Pat Rawlings draw it. This is 3D printing heat shields for Mars entry. This is a technology that Rob and another technologist at the Kennedy Space Center um, came up with, and they've developed it and had great results. Um, but there's an example, 3D additive construction on Phobos to create heat shields for Mars entry. And then a few charts about Mars. Again, we don't have a lot of work done within NASA on Mars ISRU. There's been a lot of talk over the years, but we haven't built very many prototypes yet. Um, there, there very well may be ore bodies on Mars. There is ge geology, including geothermal heat and water on the planet, and therefore there could have been um, processes that separated out high-value minerals as veins and other deposits. Uh, Mars has silicate minerals. It seems to be primarily an igneous planet. Uh, metals can be refined from these minerals, just like on the moon. May, uh, Mars does have clay minerals, unlike the moon. And so those could be used as binders for 3D additive construction. The Martian geology is extremely diverse. So there's far more than we could say about, uh, about it in the amount of time we have here. Um, Mars also has sulfates, lots of sulfates on the surface. And so sulfur can be extracted and used as a binder. And this may be more feasible than using sulfur as a binder on the moon because the temperatures on Mars are a lot cooler than on the moon. It doesn't approach the melting point of sulfur. Um, Mars also has copious water. It's very easy to access the water at the high latitudes. Um, the water is right on the surface at the poles. You see the polar caps. And it's in the shallow subsurface at the high latitudes away from the poles, including at the Phoenix Lander site. But if you're at an equatorial location, it may be very, very deep. Perhaps you could drill down to it. Um, but it's not near the surface at equatorial locations, apparently. Um, it's possible we might want to use ice as a building material directly. If you're in a cool environment, then why not just print things in water and just use the water as a structure? Um, I'm going to show you a picture where we first got this idea, the next chart. Um, Mars also has atmosphere. It's primarily carbon dioxide. There's also nitrogen, which is important for producing some compounds. Okay, so here we have the picture of the polar cap, and then two pictures from Phoenix Lander. You can see where the 
The scoops on the lander have exposed some ice just a few centimeters below the soil. But over here, we've got pictures where the thrusters have blown away the soil during landing. And we predicted that it was going to make much deeper holes than it, than it actually did make. The reason the holes weren't very deep is because there was a table of ice just a few centimeters below the surface. And so it blew away the dirt, and then the ice became a landing pad. And so the, the ice, it didn't sublimate all that rapidly with these small thrusters. And um, it, was, it was a competent landing pad. So it may be possible that when we want to land on Mars, we just build landing pads out of ice. Go excavate the water, make a slurry um, of ice and water, lay it down, it'll flash evaporate. You may get uh, not a good surface, but then you can get a Zamboni machine and Zamboni your Martian ice, um, center the ice with pressure. And um, now ice is not stable at the surface at this location. That's why it had two or three centimeters of soil on top. So, um, so wherever you are on Mars, maybe you just need to throw enough soil on top of your landing pad to keep it stable, metastable, until the lander arrives. And if you've only got two years, then calculate how much soil you need to put on top, create enough vapor barrier on top of the ice. And then when you land, you, you know you've only got that much soil to blow away and it's not a hazard for your vehicle. So that may be the way to solve this problem. Um, Marco Polo is a, a mission that the ISRU community was working on for a while. Uh, this is Marco Polo, and you can see it's now a historic site because the astronauts have arrived. Um, but Marco Polo was conceived as doing a, uh, atmospheric capture, um, then cracking the carbon dioxide to get the carbon. Um, these small rovers, which Rob's team built at the Swamp Works, these are called Razor. Um, here is a Razor unit delivering some regolith, which contains water, um, both dilute water in the, in the bulk of the regolith, but also maybe ice shavings. Um, the hydrogen from the water and the carbon from the, night, from the atmosphere can be made into methane as rocket propellant. Um, so um, the lunar processes that we've been working on apply to Mars as well. The ISRU community has always had this strategy that if you develop a process that works on one planet, build it as a building block, and then you can repurpose it to every destination in the solar system. Um, so molten regolith electrolysis can work on Mars with some re-optimization for the minerals. Um, therefore, you can make metals and ceramics on Mars. Um, if we get the ice, we're going to probably need to do water cleanup. The water probably contains salts. It has varied chemistry. We've recently learned about perchlorates in the surface of Mars, which are um, toxic. Uh, also, um, there's probably carbon dioxide ice, and uh, we know from the Phoenix landing site that there's uh, varying hardness of the ice, but uh, we need to do ground truthing on Mars to understand the content of the ice, to understand how to clean it up if we're going to be drinking it. Um, I already mentioned creating methane on Mars. And then once you've got methane, you use the fischer tropsch process to polymerize it in complex hard hydrocarbons so you can make plastics and rubbers, for example. OK, so final chart. Um, we've realized over the last few years that we have no resource shortage. Humanity is not facing a resource problem. What we're facing is an imagination problem because we tend to think that we're stuck on this one little planet, and this is all we've got, and we've got to learn how to have a sustainable life within this limited region when we're actually living in a bath of resources. There's, uh, the, the scale, the, the order of magnitude of resources in our solar system is billions of times greater than what there is on Earth. Billions with a B. Um, everything is billions of times greater when you include the main asteroid belt, for example. Um, so we need to develop technologies to get us beyond the limit of a planet. And one of the things that we're going to be doing on the route to the solar system is 3D additive construction. And so the final word I want to give you is let's think outside the sphere. Um, and I'll take any questions you've got.